Hi, and welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Winter Circle Sports Betting Podcast. It's Monday, February the 20th, and like every Monday, I'm joined by Mr. Doug Upstone of DocSports.com, and we're going to be covering a couple college basketball games that go on Tuesday, the 21st. Um, before we get to those games, Doug, how are you? I'm doing well, Ross. The uh, You know what? It's, it's a brand new week. Things uh, we're, we're, we're what? Well, we'd be, we'll be talking about the uh, – uh, t- the brackets on two weeks from today. Yeah. So that'll be fun. And uh, so that's, that's coming off, coming off a, a winning weekend overall, just had one game that kind of bugged me, but that's okay. You know, college basketball, but everything else uh, was good. Uh, and um, I, I have to admit, and I'm proud to say it. I, I, I don't know how my long, long my streak is, but I have a nice long streak now of not watching an NBA all-star game. <laughs> And I'm, pr- and I'm proud of it. Oh, man. All <laughs> I could think, I just tuned it in for background noise when I was looking at, at today's card. And um, yeah, it was like watching the Washington Generals play defense from both right. teams. You know, it just mattered or defense at its finest. It, and it's like, why even bother playing the game? You know, it, it, you know, at least in Major League Baseball, there there's it's it's not like you could really slack off in a Major League Baseball all star right. game. Um, you don't see somebody going half-heartedly toward a fly ball. Uh, you don't see pitchers who throw 95 decide to throw 88 so we can have more action in the game. Um, it, it's just, it's, I don't know what's worse, that or the Pro Bowl. I would venture to say the uh, the Pro Bowl because of I, everybody seems to opt out of that, you know, and the guys that are there are like way down the list of where, where they should be in terms of being an all-star or pro bowl uh, player. But uh, the NBA all-star game has just turned into a joke as well. I guess if you like highlight reel type of stuff, right. um, they provide plenty of it. Nice. I love the, uh, the, uh, the, the slam dunk competition. Um, yeah, that was McClung. That was amazing. Yeah. I, I did not watch it, but I saw, you know, a couple of his dunks on, on highlights and stuff like that. So that was, that was pretty cool, you know, from that standpoint. And, uh, but yeah, beyond that, I, I honestly don't, don't even know who competed in other than him. That's, yeah. That's, I mean, that's the first, first two way player to um, win the slam dunk competition ever. And what they mean by that folks, if you're not familiar with that term uh, in his contract, there's a clause they could send him down to the G league at any time and then bring him back up. They still own his rights. So um, in any event, uh, that was sort of uneventful in my eyes. Um, and the XFL got underway over the weekend. I'm not going to be dabbling with that whatsoever. <laughs> but, Doug, you were talking about it off air and just fill the folks in a little bit about what you saw in the XFL. Well, I, I think, you know, everything that that I, I read now, this obviously this was people that watched it, you know, and I, I watched a good portion of uh, the first game, which was uh, Vegas and Arlington. And, and I watched, you know, a little bit, uh, a second game, I think at some point and a little bit yesterday, just, you know, just to see with, if what I saw was to see even vaguely correct, but I mean, it wasn't terrible football. It certainly seemed better than the USFL. I have to say that. And everyone that either on social media or people that I talked to that watched them too, they said the same thing. Uh, I think uh, having a home crowd probably was somewhat beneficial, you know, so you had some noise, okay, in the stadium. So that was good. And you know what? I, I like the, I mean, not the USFL didn't have this, but I like some of the rules. Um, you know, what, what I'd like to see, maybe some of them adapt, adapted by the, or adopted by the NFL. Yeah. I, I mean, I, the, I'm not sure about the three-way uh, two-point conversion, you know, uh, or I'm sorry, sorry, the extra point, if you will, you know, about scoring three different ways, but it does add another element. I definitely like the kickoff. Uh, this USFL did this last year. So the kickoff, the, the kicker kicks off after, you know, at the beginning of the half or after a score, normal way. And I believe it's right around the, 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 the defensive team then starts at about, I think, the 30 or 35 one or the other, I can't say I was paying close enough attention to those. And then the offensive team stands five yards then in front of them. So they're only five yards apart. And then the kickoff, nobody can move until the ball is caught. Wow. And once you, so then you, then you run. Yeah, yeah. So it, it sets up the potential, you know, you, you basically have a, just one line of defense. So if you can break through, for example, 
you can create a kickoff return, a, a pretty decent one from that standpoint. And, you know, and there's less injuries because guys aren't running to have these huge head on collisions. OK, from that standpoint. So it's safer. I think that's a great one. And I also like the uh, well, the the challenges thing was far better. That's uh, that's longer story, but quicker, faster. Everything about it was better. That was good. And then the other thing I liked was if instead of the onside kick, which, you know, in the NFL at this point is about a 97 or 93 percent chance of not being recovered. You have the option to go instead of that, you can go for what's called a fourth and 15. So, you know, so didn't the uh, uh, the, USFL had that as well, didn't they? Exactly. Yes. Correct. Yeah. I I I like that. I do, too. I think that's something the NFL should entertain. But um, uh, who knows? They're <laughs> right. probably going to stay conventional with that. The kickoffs, I mean, that eliminates a lot of injuries on kickoff returns because yep. guys who are flying down from the gunner positions on the outside, even on kickoffs, uh, who run about a 4-4, some 4-5, f- uh, pretty big guys, uh, they could really lay a lick on a, running, on a uh, kick return. So yep. I like that. The three-way conversion i'm assuming two of the ways are a two-pointer from the three-yard line or two-yard line and the others one one point from i believe the two two points from the i believe i think it's the five or six and then three points uh from the ten okay so okay so like and what the beauty of that is if you're down three points after scoring a touchdown okay or even down two you can go for the win if you want especially like later in the game. So, yeah, I mean, there's something to that now. Maybe is that too gimmicky for some people? Yeah, I get that if that's the case, but I, I, I guess I don't have a problem with it from that standpoint. So, I mean, so for that type of football, it was all pretty good. And uh, Paxton Lynch looked as bad as ever. So that was, (laughs) that was good to see. And former number uh, one draft choice. It was a number one or number two. He was a high draft choice. doesn't matter. He was no good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, I guess if you're starting a uh, spring football league, uh, so many have failed in the past. Uh, none have really succeeded for any length of time. I guess you can go back to the old USFL days, right? Uh, but um, you need to have rules such as the ones you just described that are unconventional, though what we see every Sunday in the NFL. Uh, so, uh, will the NFL adopt any of those? I, you know, it would be nice if they even contemplated adopting one of them. I highly right. doubt they will because until they consider that to be uh, a marketing, um, how could I put it? Advantage. Uh, marketing competition, you know, I, I mean, uh, there's no marketing competition between the, the current league now and the spring right. in the NFL. So if they ever approach, where they're, uh, they start to see ratings go up and it's all a result. A lot of it's the result of all the different things they're doing as opposed to them, then they'll consider it. But uh, first things first, uh, you need to have a spring league last more than a couple of years. Yes. Uh, you need to have a spring league or summer league, whatever, uh, whatever uh, the off season leagues for a better phrase um, you need to have them, uh, not fold in the middle of a season. <laughs> you need right. to get your players paid and, uh, you know, not all money after you fold. It, it's it, before you take things seriously in that regard, uh, the NFL, that is, uh, I think those obstacles and hurdles need to be uh, leaped. Uh, for Yeah. I, well, you know, for, I, I mean, I can't imagine the XFL and the USFL are both going to survive. Yeah. But it would be neat, for example, if the U.S., if one of them or if they w- one of them survived and then came under the umbrella of the NFL to be what they tried to do in Europe, which is to have a developmental league. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I think that would be good. And or, for example, if you have guys on your roster, you know, and I'm just throwing this out as a as a as another crazy idea. So take guys 45 to 51 on your NFL roster who, you know, are just were special teams guys, but you know, you, you see something in them, maybe a little bit, they go there as developmental players, play a 10 game season, you yeah. know, and play, uh, you know, play, early, play an actual enough. position and see if you have anything more than a special teams player. Right. Um, I would also include the practice, play, whatever you, whoever right. you practice have on your practice guys too, squad. Right. Now yep. you're going another 17 deep if I'm not mistaken, 15 or 17. 
uh, yeah. whatever that case may be. Now you're into the twenties of uh, NFL caliber players. And, and yeah, I don't know why they never have gone to that. Um, the NFL, I guess is too arrogant because uh, they're, they're a rich organization, multi, multi billion dollar organization that really doesn't have to worry about those types of things. But similar to what we see in baseball and similar to what we see in the NHL, uh, where you have minor league teams owned by an NFL team, you yeah. know, and, and it's a pipeline kind of thing, you know, and opens up more opportunities for college players that don't make it. Somebody who gets cut. Uh, somebody who's not picked up by somebody else. I mean, there are players that have played in the XFL and USFL who have done really well in those campaigns, and it's earned them an opportunity and a paycheck on a Sunday in the NFL. But uh, they're few and far between. So that, that's for sure. Hey, I got one other thing for you. Yeah. Maybe you can answer this one for me. Can you, for the life of me, figure out why? Ohio, this, I'm talking college basketball here. Yeah. Why Ohio State almost every single game keeps getting love and literally from I, the odds makers based on the odds? It's all analytics. Get, I, 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 yeah. it's almost I'm like a loss. It's almost like you, you talk yourself out of betting against them. Right. Even it looks obvious because why is this line just what it is? I right. mean, uh, the last game against Purdue, same thing. It's how is this line where it is right now? But yeah, I you know you looked I finally at, like, went for it. <laughs> did, did you? You went against? Uh, no, Ohio. no. I mean, I finally took the. I took Purdue with the twelve. There you, you go. Know? There you and go. It's, and I've been, you know, I've been, I look at it every time, you know. Yeah. So I, I started to interrupt you, but it's just crazy to me what it's been. So go ahead, make your point. Yeah, I, I, um, the point being is, I think a lot of that is derived from uh, analytics and how the odds makers factor in things. Uh, it, Believe it or not, if you if you go to Ken Palm, for example, uh, Ohio State's still somewhere around a top 30 team offensively, you know, and to me, I watch them and it's a struggle for them to score, you know. So, um, yeah, uh, home court advantage when they're playing at home, they they get awarded the higher end of the home court advantage in terms of points, um, strength of schedule. During the non-conference, I, I, you know, it, it, my point is that is why it's happening. I don't disagree with what you're saying because the exact same thought process came to my mind when I looked at that Purdue game. How long are they going to keep respect in Ohio state? It's like trying to catch an inside straight Doug. You know what I yeah. mean? I mean, it's possible, but it's not probable kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, or or the other one I always like to use uh, is playing uh, roulette. Okay, so black hits fourteen times in a row. Well, it, you know, uh, red <laughs> got to come up. That's even a better it scenario. It's I like that even more because that's exactly uh, what what applies to Ohio State and the lines and the respect they're getting from the odds makers, and they continue to fail. You know, at a high rate. Beside against the spread. So. Yeah, I mean, these, they're not even close in many cases, especially <laughs> lately. I mean, you know, they're not within five or seven points of the line. It's I'm just boggled by it. that's one thing that this weekend of anything that I saw. It's like, why in the world does this continue? And and, and again, I got there. I can think of at least three games. Basically, I got chased off of it thinking that, you know what, I'm going to trust the odds makers on this one because they know something that I don't. But in this case, they didn't. Yeah. Yeah, there's exceptions to the rule. Oh, I, yeah. and when you see that happen with one team specifically on a few occasions, and the odds makers not right in your mind, um, yeah. that sticks in your mind. But right, most occasions when a line looks strange, uh, and you say to yourself, "The odds makers must know more than I do in this matchup," uh, more times than not you're going to be right for agreeing with the odds maker. But um, again, there's no exact way to go about it, folks, but you have to think like an odds maker, except in the case of Ohio State games this year, because they're getting way too much respect. In any event, Doug, I thought of you, um, and then we're going to get into our free picks. By the way, folks, uh, we're going to be looking at Baylor, Kansas State, and Texas A&M and Tennessee, two games on ESPN and ESPN uh, 2 tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern time. But I thought of you on Friday. I had um, I had Dartmouth 
plus 10 against Cornell. Oh, okay. Either I, they I, had I, the lead. I didn't or they see get, anything. Nip and tuck the whole way, you know? Okay. Game ends up going overtime. I'm I'm getting 10, mind you. Cornell wins by 12 in overtime. <laughs> God. So here, you know what? Let me I think I got a merit badge around here somewhere. I can send you. Okay. Yeah, but you know, I've had I I I must say I've had real good luck with overtime games this year and last year. Um and that was made up for a lot of it though. That's know? that's a rough because one. they have a double digit dog and not cover because the game goes overtime. They all got outscored 15 to 3. Uh, guys fall, fouled out at the end. The two guys that hardly ever played go in the game, and they're shooting three pointers in the last two minutes. While the guys who are regulars don't even see the ball. It's, it's just everything that could go wrong went wrong. Yeah, and uh, God bless you all who had Cornell in that game. But anyway, all right, let's I get say our, that. <laughs> with, yeah, uh, <laughs> let's get to our free picks. Um, all right, I'm uh, ready. We've been on a nice roll uh, on, on the network over our last seven videos, 14 and six on college basketball free picks. That's 70% folks. Uh, so not bad because these free picks are not our pay selection. So you could see the quality of our selections across the board with all the great handicappers here on the winner's circle sports betting podcast, by the way, folks, if you have not subscribed, please take a second to do so it costs you absolutely nothing. Uh, you're privy to some of the best handicappers in the country. Myself, Doug Upstone, uh, Sean Higgs from picksandparleys.net, Jesse Shule from jessieshule.com, and the uncomparable Joey D'Amico, my buddy Joey Baloney uh, from sportsmemo.com as well. All right, let's get right to it, Doug. Um, right now we're looking at Baylor as a one-and-a-half point favorite on the road at K-State. The total is 146. All of the floor is yours, my friend. All right. Well, you know what? Baylor, they played a absolutely perfect first half at Allen Fieldhouse Saturday. They did everything right. They had a 45 to 32 lead at halftime. We're dominating Kansas, had them on their heels. But then, you know, the number nine bears. OK, that that guard trio is the best in college basketball with Adam Flagler, Flagler L, uh, LJ uh, Cryer and that super freshman Keontae George. Kathy George, by the way, is is a real high first round pick. I mean, even as a freshman, but they're combining to score 50 points. And I think they had nearly, I, I think, upper 30s in that game, uh, as I recall, in the first half. Well, guess what? Kansas switched defense. Bill Self later admitted after the game, he made a mistake on his game plan. They switched the defenses, went to, they stopped switching, still playing man to man. And all of a sudden, the, that trio cracked. And the Jayhawks started, got misses, started running off those misses. Baylor had zero answers, got whipped 55 to 26 in the second half. Now, you know what? This doesn't make Baylor a bad team. They had a bad half, okay, from that standpoint. And one thing that should be noted, though, is that this Baylor team is not the same as the one that won the national championship two years ago, especially on defense. OK, uh, in their last uh, 10 games, five of those, they've given up 49 percent or more shooting, which is which which uh, Kansas qualified for. Now, Kansas State, after going one and four straight up and against the spread in their past five games, they needed a victory. OK, and they got one against Iowa State Saturday, 51, 60, 61 to 55. The defense reminded me of a Rob Zombie line from a song, Ross, and it's and the, and the line is strangling the breeze, okay? <laughs> because the Cyclones shot 30.7% in that, in that game. Now, while K-State got some life, they continue, though, to struggle on offense, uh, and the, the ball's just not going through the net. In their last dozen starts, they have only once shot over 46%. And in those dozen games, their average is at 40 point, basically 40% over 12 games. Now, number 14, Kansas State is 13 and 1, 10 and 4 at home. Seems natural they should be favored, but yet here they are, one and a half point underdogs. To me, the easy play here is take purple clad cats at home, 16 and 4 in Manhattan off a home win. But you know what? I'm not going to take the easy way out. I'm going to take Baylor because Baylor's 14 and five against the spread after allowing 85 or more points. And if they are off a road loss, okay, they are and, and on the road again, they're a perfect six and oh. I say Baylor barely on the money line against Kansas State. 
I like it. Um, Baylor's a really good team. Uh, take away that that last game against Kansas. You know, you look at the stats in that last game. Uh, Baylor shot 10 for 25 from the three-point line, 40%. Uh, it's hard to lose a game when, when you shoot that well from the three-point line. The difference in that game, uh, Baylor went 9 of 16 from the free-throw line. Kansas, 23 out of 27. So they outscored him by 14 points at the free throw line. Uh, Baylor shot 64% from the line. Kansas shoots 85. Uh, the big difference there. But, you know, even with that loss, Doug, Baylor's 11-2 and two in their last 13 games. Yep. You know, there's still, the according to Ken Palm, Baylor is the number two ranked team when it comes to adjusted offensive efficiency. Um, they average 122 points scored per 100 offensive possessions. That's tremendous. Uh, they also uh, commit very – they don't beat themselves. They protect the basketball very well. That goes hand-in-hand hand with what you're saying about that three-guard combo uh, that's been terrific. And uh, so, yeah, I, I I see Baylor bouncing back into spot. I did have Kansas State on Saturday, um, and I really was writing them off at one point because they were down – Eight at the half. They look listless. Um, let's let's face it, though. Iowa State, you got to give them a little bit of credit. Uh, as much as they struggle to score as well, they're a terrific defensive team and they're a very, very frustrating team to play against because they'll use the majority of the shot clock on offense, then they play stench defense, stout defense, excuse me, uh, and, and they're very difficult to play against. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, just so it's a good game. So, all right. So tell me, I like this one, Tennessee and Texas A&M. What do you got? Yeah. Um, right now, uh, you were looking at Texas A&M as a one point favorite at home against Tennessee. The total in this game is 129. You know, I was talking to you about this off air. I mentioned it last week on one of our podcasts as well. I am not sold on Tennessee. Uh, do they play terrific defense? Yes. Um, but when a team shoots as poorly as they do, Doug, and they're so reliant on their offensive rebounding for easy putback opportunities or uh, extending offensive possessions and wearing defenses down, that works in last also not too long is in ter- in terms of when the NCAA tournament arrives. I'm f- I firmly believe that Tennessee, if they do not attain one of the top two seeds in the region, will be out by the round of 32. Now, having said that, let's get to this game. Uh, Tennessee has lost three of their last four and four of their last six. They're also 0-3 straight up in ATS in their last three conference away games, losing by 8.7 points per contest, and they were a favorite in all three of those contests and go hand-in-hand to what I was just describing before about their offensive struggles in no, that 0-3 straight up in ATS in their last three on a road stretch, they've only scored 57.7 points per game. Uh, they are coming off that 66-54 loss at Kentucky. They shot just 37.2% in that game, and they allowed uh, the Kentucky Wildcats to get to the free throw line 35 times. And that's been a, if there's an Achilles heel for Tennessee defensively, it's the fact that they uh, tend to foul more than others and put teams on the free throw line uh, a lot more frequently than uh, I believe the coaching staff would like. Uh, This Texas A&M team is no joke defensively. Uh, They've allowed 62 points or less in four of their last five. Uh, They've quietly had a tremendous season so far as a matter of fact they're 12 and 2 in conference play including 5 and 0 in their last five and they've won 14 of their last 16 overall um and that includes 8 and 0 in conference home games this year and looking at this line right now being minus one uh when you have an undefeated team a conference uh that's undefeated at home in conference play certainly worth noting and certainly can't be ignored uh, I mentioned that 35 free throws allowed by Tennessee in a loss to Kentucky. Well, Texas A&M is number three nationally in free throw attempts per game. So they they uh, know how to get to the free throw line, and when they get there, they're very good. As a matter of fact, in SEC play, 
Texas A&M is the top free throw shooting team percentage wise at 76.5%. Uh, I am going to go with Texas A&M here. It's minus one. I would say um, I would wait a little bit on this one. We're recording at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time on Monday. So the game is more than 24 hours away. So depending on when you view this video, this line could change. And uh, if, if for some reason Texas A&M goes to a dog, that's even better. And if it stays where it is right now or even goes up to like a minus two, I would definitely take Texas A&M on the money line uh, as long as they're minus 135 or less. So I like Texas A&M over Tennessee, Doug. You know, I like this Texas A&M team. You know, I was surprised at how poorly they played early. And I wondered what was up, you know, because, I mean, I, I believe they were either ranked or, you know, right there to be ranked. And, you know, they and they just kept stumbling, you know, uh, over and over again. But, you know, they're well coached. OK, uh, from that standpoint. So they, they have that and they just figured it out, you know, and, and the different players seem to have gotten their roles down, you know. And I mean, and the thing is, is that I say they win this game and they went out to their last game. Their last game of the season is at home against Alabama, wow. which conceivably could be for the SEC championship. Okay, regular season, anyways, from that standpoint. So, so they have a lot of reasons to play. Uh, you know, not that they wouldn't, anyways. But I, yeah, I agree. I think this Tennessee team, if they if if they don't shoot, you know, they're going to have a hard time winning. And I don't know that they'll shoot that well against A and M uh, on the road, especially. So, no, I like Texas A and M here too, Ross. Yeah, I mean Tennessee. It's just it's lasted too long. Okay, they've struggled to score for especially when they got into conference play and against power five or power conference teams not power five power conference teams uh they've struggled in those situations and and um if it hasn't been fixed by now doug uh i think that their their identity right now is is uh place the kind of defense they've played all season long attack the offensive glass uh create some turnovers and, and some transition opportunities and that's all fine and dandy against teams that uh, you have more talent than. Um, when you start getting into the competition in the NCAA tournament, I'm referring to, I'm not talking about they're a bad team. They're not a bad team. They're no. a real good team. But in terms of the NCAA tournament, you're going to need some good offensive play. Some One or two guys is going to have to step up and carry the team on his back offensively. And I don't know who that is right now. Uh, because they haven't been able to do so right along. Uh, certain players have had great games, yeah, uh, on certain occasions, but the consistency just isn't there offensively, Doug. No, it's not. Well, here's here's one for you, okay, because I'm not a fan of this guy. Now, this, is, this goes back for some of the viewers that are longer-time NBA fans. My opinion, Rick Barnes is the Don Nelson of college coaches, okay? <laughs> you might remember Don Nelson – yeah. Ton of wins, always had very good teams, never won anything. Yeah. Well, what's Rick Barnes done? Pretty much the same thing. Yeah, you haven't been That's a Rick my Barnes story. guy since I've known you. You you've mentioned that, so and, and I <laughs> yep. can't disagree with you. I mean, uh, you know, good he, coach, great yeah. coach, actually. Just, He'll get you just the doesn't... NCAA tournament on a consistent basis, but once yep. there, uh, it, it's there's not been a lot of deep runs, if any. Uh, so in any event, Doug, tell the folks where they could find you and uh, what you may have coming up this week and uh, any hot streaks you'd like to yeah. talk about. Well, the, you know, the, the, uh, we, we got a lot of different things going on and we got the, uh, well, a couple different things. Something else is going on with me too on this. We got the NHL continues to do well, 24 and 25 and 16. Okay. Run of late 61%. I believe that comes to, and uh, even with a unfortunate push yesterday with uh, the total on, uh, now I'm forgetting the game Rangers. Uh, I think it was rain. Yeah. Rain, it, it was, it, it was supposed to go. I had it under, it, it, they tied it. For, it was Rangers in Winnipeg. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's right. Couldn't think of the other team, but yeah. yeah. So that, that was that, but they, you know, th those things happen. At least I had the six. Yeah. Uh, that's so that was, that was better, but no, so good run there. Uh, NBA, not until Thursday. Uh, so got, got started to get some heating up a little bit on that. Hit 62.5% of those plays. Had a, like I said, a, a good winning weekend of college basketball. I got that. And next or this Sunday, Ross, 
I'm going to be at the Cubs and Dodgers game for spring training. So I'm excited about that. You know, had a didn't have as good a, two years ago. It was number one handicapper at Docs and in the top five at other monitors as well. Last year, not quite as good, but had a hellaciously good finish last year. Okay, that that really saved the season for me. So that was good. So I'm really looking forward to Major League Baseball. Get it. So you are, are you gonna are you gonna be when you're on your appearances here? Is there a possibility you'll be at a spring training site? Yeah. Well, in fact, that's one of the things when we're off air. Was got I wanted to ask you about. So yes, that would be a distinct possibility. But that's we got to get one thing cleared up though on it. So I'll talk okay. tell you about that later. Very good. I would look forward to that as long as all the specifics fall into into line and what we right. need to do. So in any event, you can find me at RossBenjaminSports.com or RBWins.com, whatever you prefer. After a, an atrocious eight-day stretch, um, I broke out of it somewhat over the weekend, going five and three with my college basketball picks. Um, I had uh, Michigan State, uh, or excuse me, Michigan over Michigan State on Saturday as my 10-star top play yesterday, cashing easily as NC State uh, pulled away down the stretch to defeat North Carolina. By the way, folks, both of those were money line plays and both were minus 135 or less. Again, I can't emphasize that enough. Instead of laying one and a half or two or even one or even two and a half sometimes, if you can get 135 or less, do it. Uh, because the last thing, I mean, yes, the the chances of it lay, uh, falling on one or two uh, are, are um improbable but it, it happens quite a bit and if you, you have that kind of line eh, you'll regret it so in any event um for doug upstone and ross benjamin we like to wish each and every one of you all the very best uh and also folks don't forget give us a like and if you haven't subscribed hit that subscribe button until the next time take care and god bless folks